Good morning and welcome everyone to our Bible study for Saturday, June 8th, 2019. We are broadcasting from the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent in Plainfield, New Jersey. And our moderator is Shardell from Pennsylvania, who is here today. Thank you. Shall we begin? Our quote is from the Christian, it's called From Christian Science. It's Clear, Correct Teaching by Herbert W. Yusuf. Quote, the commandments are all in one and one in all, and all for one and one for all. One isness from which all is in perfect agreement. End quote. I love that comment about perfect agreement. No conflict in God or the things of God. Even though the commandments are ten, they all complement each other. They're all based on the one God. Leave room for any conflict. Well, to me, it comes like obey them all. That's it. Yeah, you can't say that one is not relevant. We can't pick and choose. (laughs) Well, nine out of ten is not a passing grade. (laughs) No. Well, I was reading something about "Thou shalt not steal" commandment that it encompasses all of the other commands, because murder is stealing of another person. Life. Adultery is stealing of another person's spouse. Giving false testimony is stealing justice. Coveting is the desire to steal what belongs to another person. <laughs> so, in a way, I mean, that's certainly true, and, and in many ways, they're all interrelated. They all need to be obeyed. Same way the synonyms for God are all interrelated. <laughs> I, I like how Herbert Eustace brings out the isness, and because he says that a lot, and it just makes me think it's not, it's not waiting for me to catch up. It already is happening now. <laughs> so. Go on. Okay, sure. So our Bible readings are still Exodus 23 to 17. And then the additional readings for this time were the spiritual interpretation of the Ten Commandments by Mary Baker Eddy, which I think are very interesting when you put them side by side and you start looking at them and how they, how they fit together. Let someone read them. Who would like to read? Well, number one is true creation. One God, one mind, one cause, one creator. Two is false creation. Mortal mind forms its own concepts and fears or loves them. Three, creation. Scholastic theology takes God's name in vain by believing his creation is both material and spiritual. As there is but one creator, there is but one creation. Four, reign of harmony. Five, reflection. Six, Christ. By reflecting our father-mother God, thereby uniting in one consciousness the male and female, the Christ is born, which reveals man as eternal. Seven, unity. Knowing that we reflect the male and female, we must not adulterate this idea by supposing that each of God's children is not complete, infinite. Seeing this purity, 
we are partakers of the marriage supper of the Lamb, the unity of man with the spiritual idea. 8. Individuality. Mortal mind cannot steal from our individuality by making us suppose personality or any phase of matter has power to give to or take away from God's idea, anything. 9. Love. Love thy neighbor as thyself. See the spiritual idea. And 10. Fulfillment. Love gives us all things. Nice. And that's on our um, on the articles page for Mrs. Eddie. Oh, okay. yeah, she kind of sums it, each one up. So we're ready for the eighth commandment which is, Thou shalt not steal. I found an a interesting commentary from Benson Commentary, and it says, uh, it is fairly short, this comment forbids us to rob ourselves of what we have by sinful spending or of the use and comfort of it by sinful sparing and to rob others by invading our neighbor's rights, taking his goods or house or field, forcibly or clandestinely, overreaching in bargain, not restoring what is borrowed or found, withholding just debts, rents, or wages, and, which is worst of all, to rob the public in the coin or revenue for that which is dedicated to the service of religion." Unquote. And I thought that was really interesting, and it reached into some areas that I hadn't really thought about before. And uh, it really, and then of course Matthew Henry gets even into it more. But uh, I thought this was uh, a little shorter and sweeter. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well. I'd like to say something that's occurred to me in the past few months is that if I fail to share something that that God has given me to share, then that is stealing. <laughs> and it it really made me think, like the the talent He gave me, or if I have, I'm supposed to give somebody a kind word or a rebuke or anything, and if I don't do that, then that is stealing. Well, that's good. That's important. Because there are a lot of ways people steal <laughs> that uh, you might not think of as stealing. And in the Bible, it uh, warns us not to rob God. And I think Jeremy touched on that. Take what God gives us. Not pay for it. Is stealing. And how do you pay for the good that God gives us, gives you? By giving it to others? Yeah. One, you, you give God credit for it. You thank him. You tell others who are willing to listen <laughs> <laughs> how you got it. And then you share it with those that God directs you to share it with. But if you just selfishly keep it. Yeah, that's one of the uh, most important points, robbing God. In one of the commentaries it says, we regularly rob God. We rob him of time and talent. We invest in lesser things. We rob him of praise due to his name and the worship he deserves. We rob God of our priorities and our passions. We rob God of possessions, money, and property. 
This commandment teaches us that God owns it all. He is the creator and the provider. So stealing is a sin against God in two ways. It is failing to trust his provision. And secondly, it is an assault on God's providence for others. So when you think of all God gives us, including our time, how much time do you spend Usefully. Usefully with the Father and helping others and praying and watching. we just in the middle of the rat race. Do you tithe? Where, this, this is a, this stems from, I forget where it is in the Bible. Is it Micah? One of the chapters in the Bible talks about robbing God. And then it goes into the tithing. And where did you well, it does say. But I do remember something like that. I'm yeah, sure we've had it in lessons. So it's quite biblical, and we must think about it because perhaps this is the most important way to, to think about this commandment. Because how awful steal from God. Yeah. There is a biblical statement about casting your bread on the waters, which means, well, to me it means you take what you have, but you use it for in God's service in some way, instead of just, you know, burying it like the one guy that wanted talent, wanted to keep it, so he buried it in the ground. But on the waters, you use it in God's service. That's exactly right. But get the talents that you have, are you using it for God's service? And... And in that, that means meeting the needs of others. You know, sometimes people feel prideful of their various talents, and they they want other people to desire what what they have. You could, I sometimes see it with musicians or artists, um, and and others in other ways. They think somehow, you know, if they do something well, they should get recompense for it. People should want it. And maybe that's true in some instances. But my question is, has it met anybody's need? Are you just wanting your needs met? If you just want your needs met, then think again. And, and that's why, was Gary talking about a poor artist or what's that expression? Artist. Starving artist, right. Yeah, well, there might be a reason for that. I mean, there's so many pictures you can put in your house. There's so many, you know, knickknacks and things you can put in your house. Unless unless you are doing it in the service to bless others. You know, that's one thing with Luann. She's an artist, but her purpose was to bless others. Um, it wasn't the desire that she be blessed, although she is being blessed by it, but it was how she could help others. And that's why her little business has been successful. Also, I would say about Luann, she never looks for any recognition or credit. She doesn't want it on, back on herself. And this whole de the idea of desiring the praise of men, so to speak, is very suspect. Check your motivations what's driving you. Right. And also she, I mean, all these beautiful pictures she does for the uh, magazine, I mean, she gets no recompense for that. Uh, mon monetary, anyway. She just does it. But she loves. Luann, you want to add anything? I was just thinking that, that like what Jeremy said, if you don't share your talents with others, then it's like stealing. You know, if those ideas come to me to share with you and the world and to put the picture in the magazine, then there's some reason for it, something that someone may connect with that and connect with God. So that's that's my only purpose. I, I don't really see any recompense in that as far as getting paid to do that. Why would I want to get paid to do that? My, my pain, my reward is the fact that I brought somebody to God. 
and it, it, it does come out in my regular life. I mean, the, the shop is doing well, and, you know, everything here seems to fall into place. May struggle for a day or two to figure things out, and then it seems to just go according to God's will. So I, I don't want to interfere with that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. That's it, and that's it. But, 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 but you, you recognize that the ideas and the talent are given to you by God. And that's a huge first step. And and the laborer is worthy of his hire. So, so you should be fairly compensated for everything that you do. And in your case, God is compensating you for everything that you do. And also, from the very get-go, her desire was to bless others. It wasn't to sell painting. It was to bless others. And because she wanted to bless others, she has been selling painting. But that motive must precede, because you do see it, you know, these musicians and artists, and frankly, there's so many out there, and they want to sell their music or their art or whatever, but... What's the motive behind it? And I guess it's true not just for artists and musicians. It's probably true for every kid. For anybody. Mm -hmm. I think people get trapped thinking that inspiration is only going to come to me in one way. This is my talent, so obviously mm -hmm. my inspiration needs to come this way. And when you hear about people getting writer's block and stuff, it's probably God saying, well, I need to do something else. <laughs> you know? I mean, Lou, Lou Ann, she does her painting, and then she comes down here and makes a bookshelf, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know very flexible, you know. You can't say, well, this is my talent, and I refuse to do anything else. Um, it's God's talent, so you let him mold you. There are lists of things, I mean, maybe these are very blatant things of stealing, but one is stealing human beings, so that's called slavery. Or all this trafficking that goes on right now, right? Children, sex, trafficking, I mean, kidnapping. And this, this commentary says that critics of the Bible argue that the Bible allowed such slavery and defended slavery by using the Bible, which stated as being wrong. So slavery is big. Of a both a big no no, <laughs> absolutely, and that's how um, Grant won the Civil War, knowing that never deviated on that fact. Wrong, stealing another person's reputation, dignity, etc. Stealing a person's good name, whether through libel, slander, or gossip, is a particularly destructive form of theft. Unlike money or property, once a person's good name has been stolen, it can almost never be fully restored. As Shakespeare put it in Othella, who steals my purse steals trash. Tis something, nothing twas mine. Tis his. But he who, that flitches from me my good name robs me of that which not enriches him and makes me poor indeed. Stealing a person's dignity, known as humiliation, public, do permanent damage. Stealing a person's trust, and that means tricking people into buying something. The real estate agent admits telling a prospective purchaser about the flaws in a home. Another person who would deceive Deceive someone by insincere proclamations of love in order to obtain material or sexual favors. It all goes to uh, motive. Stealing a person's intellectual property. Copying software or films to download music and movies without paying for them. Plagiarism. Uh, we're going to get to that changing them to make it your own. Yes, yes. And then, and this is a very big one that I hadn't really been thinking of, is the corruption it does in society. 
There is another reason why stealing may well be the ultimate root of most evil. The reason is corruption. Think about this. Virtually every society in history, and most societies in the world today, certainly the non-democratic ones, were and are filled with corruption. People pay government officials for favors. Government officials get rich selling state companies and contracts. Individuals pay police or government officials to avoid prosecution. Judges are bribed to twist verdicts. Schools and officials are bribed to get a son and daughter into a prestigious university, and so on. More than anything else, it is widespread corruption that makes it impossible for a society to progress politically, morally, or economically. And unfortunately, we are seeing some of this in our country today. God forbid that it become more widespread. Think about it. I mean, I, I know people who have come from other countries, and, you know, it's scary how you, you can get bribed. I mean, you can be an innocent person, and you can get put in jail for no good reason. You can thank God for the liberties we have in our nation right now, but if they must be safeguarded because this is going on. All of it. Thou shalt not steal. There's great penalty. I love what Miss, Mrs. Eddy says about the Eighth Commandment. You want to read that again? Because I thought it, would, it gets to the core of just about everything. Individuality. Mortal mind cannot steal from our individuality by making us suppose personality. For any phase of matter has power to give to or take away from God's idea. Any. All right. It all goes back to the believing that matter has life in it, that we need it to live. That is profound, I think, because I, it feels like then if you know better, and you still um, not making an effort to um, have in your own thought, at least, your individuality, your spiritual perfection, then you are really stealing in a way, because that's not what God has made. What belongs to God, if we all belong to God like we are learning, then it's that spiritual perfection that true being that belongs to God. So to adulterate it in any way through our own wrong thinking perpetually, then we're stealing. Yes. Mm -hmm. The only way we're going to ever stop stealing is when we realize that life is spiritual and not material. So that's number 10. Right? Love gives us all things. So why steal? Yeah. Yeah. That's why all the commandments are one and the same. In essence. And you see, while people believe that they lack, that's the cause of the competition, the wars, the jealousy, the hatred. He has and I don't. And, and last all, oh, go ahead. No, also, I feel that, you know, different nations have been given different resources. Why not just use them to bless each other? What I don't have, you can have some of it. Leave me some. But that's not what happens. That's also stealing. Yeah, it would actually. be much better. Everybody would be blessed from God's good that he has given mankind. It would be less... Uh, less of these envies and uh, wars even from this kind of deal. There's a biblical uh, uh, backing up of what you just said there, which is uh, in First Kings, um, Solomon wanted wood for building the temple, so he traded 
uh, wheat being food for the lumber. And he was so powerful at that time, he could have gotten on it and taken it on his own, but he did a fair trade. Uh, and it's very interesting about wages because what he did was he uh, sent uh, 10,000, I think it was, or 9,000 men to help out on the work, and they would work one month, have 3,000 would work one month and then have two months off. So they were even being, it was even being fair to the workers because they could then take care of the stuff at home and then go work for him. And uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, um, it is so subtle <clears throat> because uh, I didn't realize how much was in the Bible about uh, Leviticus 19, 35. It says, You shall do no unrighteousness in judgment, in meat yard, in weight, or in measure. Just balances, just weight, a just ephah, a just hin, ye shall ye have. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of slavery, my footnote. Therefore shall ye observe all my statutes and all my judgments, and do them. I am the Lord. So in 30 years of farming, my family and any other farmer who didn't sell directly to the consumer never sold. I never sold one pound of milk or beef where we didn't get cheated on price or weight or both or quality. The scales were rigged. They were sealed by the government, but there was one slaughterhouse where the scales were off 80 pounds of white. So every cow weighed on the scale person was cheated 80 pounds, and then on the other hand, in adultery, then uh, like chicken, you can legally soak it in water, add up uh, to 20% of its weight by adding water to it. So there's, and I think uh, when I was younger, I never heard of uh, human trafficking, and I think it's just the laxity with all types of these things that... Uh, leads to uh, eventually slavery of all people. So we still have work to do, don't we? Right. Yes. Yep. yep. And this is, this is, that's right, this is the roadmap. This is the chart of life, because only by recognizing that life is spiritual and not material, and that God provides our needs, that our commandment is to love our neighbor as ourself. That's the only answer to any of this garbage that is really a great hindrance to society. Because along with stealing comes greed. And you had sent me a quote, Mike, from an old journal. I don't know if you have it. Anyway, it just talks about that that Greed has brought into our nation's life much of a lot of things we don't need. And this was written in 1903. So, and it was with good moral rottenness has always resulted in oppression and extinction. It was with good reason that God, through Moses, commanded that the vineyard and harvest were not to be gleaned to the last grape or grain, but something was to be left for the poor. No, and that, that eliminates this greed. And again, if we obeyed the biblical rules of finance, we would none of us would be in debt, nor would our nation be in debt. So these apply to nations as well as people, don't they? Miscellaneous writing her article in Justice, Mrs. Eddy says, What hinders man's progress is his vain conceit, the Pharisee of, of the time, also his effort to steal from others and avoid hard work, errors which can never find a place in science. Empirical knowledge is worse than useless. It never has advanced man a single step in the scale of being. What's empirical knowledge? It's funny because I 
was thinking about the widow and her two mites, and uh, when I uh, read that, I didn't realize that just before Jesus uh, talked about her, he said, uh, Beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplace and the chief seats in the synagogues and uppermost rooms at the feet, feast, which devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, you shall receive greater damnation. And uh, Matthew Henry points out that uh, the hypocrisy of using uh, the church or their religion as an excuse or a cover for uh, devouring the widow's houses. And then I'm thinking, well, the reason the poor widow has only two mites is because, as what you just pointed out, there's not fairness. But then the other thing is, is that it's even a bigger crime is uh, that they're stealing uh, the correct view of God by using uh, God as a weapon to take from others. And if a person, if they would teach God's goodness, like uh, Christian science and this church does, and that supply is infinite, there would be enough to go around for everybody. You know, scientists have proved that. We have an inexhaustible source for everything. Of course, God's creation would. All, all of these things are, are in, a, in abundance of everything. It is, it is all of this carnal mind that limits. Because it, it worships the abundance, the things, instead of worshiping the source. And isn't that what's happened in Boston? I mean, they have, they have billions at their disposal up there. And what the hell are they doing with it? Yeah, we would like to know. <laughs> And that's who Jesus was referring to, because one year I got a message from them that it was a pity that this is any limited uh, yearly dues to the Mother Church at $1, and uh, we should all donate more. So I wrote back to them, if you have a billion uh, church members, you get a billion dollars. Well, it's, it's just like the same pattern as the Catholic Church, isn't it? The Catholic Church owns the biggest real estate owner in the world. And the, and the Vatican is made of gold. Right. Surrounded by a... a Surra uh, surrounded by a big, huge wall, so big, nobody can get wall. in. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and the idea, and that's a, a good point, too, this idea of prohibiting the use of a Bible in a country. That's stealing the Bible, right? It's taking... Prohibiting Christianity in countries, stealing man's right to know and worship God, stealing religious, any religious liberty. All, all of these are forms of stealing, wicked forms of stealing. And it has no, the... Lauren? Okay. No, I think the... the sense of the selfishness in all of it, which is uh, a contrast to selflessness, which is a, a, one form of loving. It just shows that, that the commandment to love thy neighbor, how important it is, because that has the selflessness in it. And then contrast is all this, the selfish, I have to have somebody else, I'm we, because this, to steal is with an intent to rob somebody, to take what belongs to someone. So that, sense, that uh, selfishness, I think, is very prominent here. There's going to be a lot of misunderstanding what, what dominion means. You know, this, the Ten Commandments seem to help us to dial it in. <laughs> what, what, what that dominion is. Not against I thought it was interesting um, that uh, from the last one we were talking about thou shalt not commit adultery and I think one of the comments from that one was that God made man satisfied and I think this works really well here 
with thou shalt not steal, that we need to be content and satisfied with what God gives us. Because it's great for us to have that. Yes. Well, and we, and, we, and we get there only when we understand that life is spiritual and not material. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, there's always going to be some dissatisfaction if you think life, if there's life, truth, substance, or intelligence in matter. There'll be no end to your misery. And one of the most important points here is if you get on that level, if you start thinking that, oh, these, these people are doing me in, and oh, our government is evil, and oh, I've got, you know, all this stuff. If you get on that level, you will continue to be in that Adam dream, and you will continue to have hell. And all these things will come upon you, especially as a Christian scientist. You think people want to steal from you. You think you've got something that someone else doesn't have. I mean, the list goes on. That you must guard your thoughts against if you don't want to have it continually happen. Sometimes people wonder, well, why are people always doing me in? Well, it's because you expect it, you see it, you think about it, you chew on it, you're angry about it, and you will have it. You've got to rise up to this new sense of who and what you are and that you have everything you need. No one is going to take anything that you have because they have everything that they need. You're going to see everyone as your brother, as a child of God, and you will rise up to the right concept of life, spiritual life, and you will begin to experience heaven on earth rather than hell. So don't get into that false picture. And if, if, things, if things were done wrong to you, if there has been injustice, what? Forgive it. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. You forgive forgiveness. Forgiveness, vengeance is mine. The years of the locust, God will restore. Forgive and be free. Yes. God requires the past. Yes. I love the um, the lesson of the prodigal son. When, when the Father says, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. Yes. And when you know that, and even if things have been taken or you've had some bad past experience, God will restore the years that, have, that have, the locust has eaten. Follow the, follow the truth in Mrs. Eddy's works and in the Bible. And you will come up and out of it. But if you don't, and you get on that level, and you start chewing, and this one did that, and the government is doing this to me, you will continue in that hell. Guaranteed, okay? I'll tell you right now. Guaranteed. You're 100% right, because I've been there and done that. (laughs) And one of the things that I'm very, very grateful for with Christian Science is that now I can go back and make sense of what happened. Okay, so I was angry and everything, but the one thing was that I had a partnership on the farm with my sister, and we we refused to adulterate, and we tried to always be honest and sell the most pure and perfect product possible, and uh, we actually made money in spite of all the injustice. So you can survive with the injustice better with Christian science, it's just the simple thing of having one factor like honesty or another factor of love and forgiveness and not the whole complete picture, you can still survive through it. And you'll probably be sleeping better than if you had done the other way. Yes, you will. Yes, you will, because God preserves the righteous. He gives us rest. That these are laws and principles of the universe. If obeyed, it might not happen at first. You might get knocked around for a while, but eventually, it will it will work out. It has to, guaranteed. And those who have done you wrong, well, <laughs> God's they law, divine their, justice, they will have their day. They will have their day. Yeah, it says it doesn't go unpunished. It's in both Mississippi's writings and. Bible. Yes, this is evidence that watch. God's law of divine justice is in full and complete operation. The wicked shall not go unpunished. 
And I work with that to this very day. And if they're lucky, it happens sooner than later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Somehow here Not to the other person they did something to, but the person that did that, the sooner they find out, the better. <laughs> Always better to learn your lesson quickly when it takes a long time. It's so much bigger when it takes a long time. That's for sure. So you you can live in a world full of you know, and we do full of the Adam dream, and you don't necessarily have to experience it if you keep your thoughts with God. And the Bible is proof of this over and over and over again. That's why we study it. And, and Jesus prayed not for his apostles to be taken out of the world, but to be kept from the evil. Thank you, yes. Exactly. And Mrs. Evans also taught us that no one can want what I have. And that's a protection for the future, for now and for the future. And the, let the past bury the past. Very true. And that's something, you know, if, if, you, do, if you are blessed with something, we were always taught to protect it, knowing that what I have is available to everyone, and no one can want what God has given me. You never lose what God has given you. But then your whole attitude is one of sharing and giving and not hoarding and, and hating your neighbor or thinking, oh, gosh, she looks suspicious. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and people do that. They live their lives. That's the gated communities. <laughs> All right, now we are going to get into one big factor on thou shalt not steal because it concerns a lot of things, but it certainly concerns steady, and that is plagiarism. It's literally theft. You can call it, you can't polish it, it's just theft. Thank you. You want to give us what was science and health, Charlie? This is science and health. Page 112, called on Sandy Foundations. Any theory of Christian science which departs from what has already been stated and proved to be true affords no foundation upon which to establish a genuine school of this science. Also, if any so-called new school claims to be Christian science and yet uses another author's discoveries Without giving that author proper credit, such a school is erroneous, for it inculcates a breach of the, that divine commandment in the Hebrew Decalogue, thou shalt not steal. Thank you. Science and health. Well, there's something else in science and health in the preface, which she begins with. She says that the first edition of science and health was published in 1875, various books on mental healing have since been issued, most of them incorrect in theory and filled with plagiarisms from science and health. They regard the human mind as a healing agent, whereas this mind is not a, phase, it's not a factor in the principle of Christian science. Thank you. Very important. Sometimes we don't realize how many people out there did this during Mayor Baker Eddy's time. I mean, uh, the list just goes on and on. Every time, time, now and then, I stumble into a new name like, oh, gosh, this was a student of Mary Baker Eddy who left and then started doing their own writings, and which don't seem a whole lot different, you know? Um in fact, uh, there was even, I mean, it just went in all various ways you can think of. There was even uh, Jewish science. So, um, and not to take away from Jewish science, uh, I, I don't know that much about it, but uh, uh, there were a lot of different people who went out there and wrote things that were kind of similar. So. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Which I don't think we see as much today, you know. But we do see the effect of it in a lot of ways. Yeah. Very rough. Right. We, we always preface, 
you you have an absolute right to read whatever you want to. One of the objections we have about being told what we should read or not read. But we also have a right to warn who is telling of the foe in ambush. And there are a lot that plagiarize Mrs. Eddy. And those books, we are very careful not to put on our website or sell them. We have the creme de la creme. If you want to know what's really the good science, just look on our at our store. Because this other is all over the place. The Bible says to prove all things and hold fast to that, which is that it's just true. true. So uh, I don't necessarily want to say that everybody falls in this category of plagiarism who uh, copying Mayor Baker. I think some of these people were people who had problems with the organization and then they left. So we have Eustace, for example. Okay? Who left the church? Oh, wait, wait, wait. He no, no. doesn't plagiarize. Exactly. So I, I just want to say, if you uh, see someone who's writing about Christian science, don't necessarily presume from our conversation that they're plagiarizing. If they give full credit, yeah. as you said, over right. and over and over it's throughout the book. Different. And that's mm -hmm. obvious. Yeah, that's and that is obvious. Right. Yeah. But there are many. But then you've got Goldstein and all these other. Oh, oh. Gold, Gold. Gold. I, I just want yeah. to paint a broad brush that if you're not part of the organization, whatever you're right, I mean, there is a lot of good stuff out there. But I, but I think uh, we have to also realize that these are a couple generations removed. So New Age started back as whatever theosophy or whatever when Isavetti was on Earth, and now it's two steps removed, so we might not see it as a direct opposition, but that's where it started also. So it is continuing today, and that's a huge issue. Theosophy yeah. is so re relevant. It's just a different name. Theosophy comes from the, the Oriental uh, religions or philosophies, I guess some people call them. It's just that we use different terms, but it's still full loop. You have to know what you're reading. It's like, to me, I keep going back to the idea of ingredients in food. You look at what you're eating. You have to look at what you're reading, digesting. And if you do any research, you can follow any of these lineages to where their source is. And uh, I think that's really important. Because uh, Mrs. Eddy said, uh, was quoted twice in uh, this book, a miscellaneous document by Carpenter, I don't know if you've got the same one as I did, but um, in here she says, if you break a bottle, you will be cut by the fragment, never by the whole vessel. There is a little truth in all creeds, isms, and ologies, but if you try to find the truth in a part of the vessel, you will get cut. Study the Bible and science and health and leave the fragments alone. And then she said, and that was quoted by Martha Bowes. Then Janet Coleman heard the same thing at another time where she talks about that, um, that the study said that all religions have some good in them, but we must have on the undivided garment or we would cut our fingers. So if we accept the science of part, it would be like broken glass liable to cut the fingers. Thank you very much. <laughs> In the lesson this week, too, it says to begin rightly is to end rightly. So. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And where else, but in her revelation, does she teach us about the unreality of both error, matter, animal magnetism, also cross-bearing? This new age does not, and it can appear very attractive in, in her article, Obedience, that he says, in subordination to the law of love, even in the least or strict obedience thereto, tests and discriminates between the real and the unreal scientist. Justice, a prominent statute in the divine law, demands of all trespassers upon the sparse individual rights which one justly reserves to oneself. Would you consent that others should tear up your landmarks I find that really interesting that she mentions landmarks, as we know they did take get rid of everything. Boston got rid of hers. <laughs> Manipulate your students 
nullify or reverse your rules, countermand your orders, steal your possessions, and escape the penalty therefore? No. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. And it goes on, but... How interesting that Boston is all of those things. Yes, thank you very much, Boston. You really followed her instructions to the... So this, this, is, <laughs> partly, <threw> <laughs> this is partly meant by Eustace, because, uh, um, uh, you know, there's one way of looking at Christian science. This is Mary Baker Eddy and, and the science and health, and we're looking to her as a leader, or are we look into an organization in Boston. And sometimes we don't always see a distinction there, and I think there really is a huge distinction here. So as an example, the uh, Boston Church has been trying for a number of years to become the National Council of Churches. But they tell them one of the things they've got to do is to, to look at Mary Baker Eddy as not being a leader because that conflicts with the other Christian churches. So today, they are still trying to destroy her image. Exactly mm -hmm. right. Thank you very much. And that undermines everything. And that's why to see her as the woman in the apocalypse is so vitally important. If you want to heal and practice Christian yes, science. Yes, thank you. If you want to heal and practice Christian science. You wouldn't say about Jesus Christ, well, oh, he was just, I mean, there are <laughs> do that, but oh, he was just a good man, and there are a lot of other mm -hmm. good men, and Maybe the resurrection happened, maybe it didn't. I probably think it didn't. Well, that just undermines everything. And if you think that, you can't, you're not going to be able to get the full power, the thrust of this science. You have adulterated it. You have disobeyed all the commandments, all, all in one swoop. That's why it is so important. Now, also in that miscellaneous document, she speaks of this Ursula Gesterfeld, who started New Thought, while Mrs. Eddy was still here. And this, and this is what she said about that. This is a Martha O. writes this. Of all these writers, Ursula Gesterfeld is the most dangerous, the most subtle, and why? Because she talks so much the truth as to almost deceive the very elect and then poisons the whole by her terrible theosophical terms. It is not her personality that Mrs. Gesterfield is attacking, meaning Mrs. Eddy. It is the truth. Jesus said, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. No one can rob Caesar and give God the glory. All she asked of anyone was that we obey the command to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God the things that are God. If Jesus had not declared his divine origin, he would not have been crucified. If she, Mrs. Eddy, had not declared that science was revealed truth, mortal mind would be proud of it. She had feared that the truth was to be crucified again, that is, would be so mixed with error that it would be lost. That was what Mrs. Gesterfield was doing in trying to simplify her book but she hoped and felt that it would not be. This idea of simplifying science, that, you know, that we can't understand it, it's too hard. Well, who says that? And there is a cheek. The human mind. Stupid, the stupid human so-called mind says that. Which is lazy. Well, and to get back to Tom's point, what, what does Mrs. Eddy tell us about how to look at, quote, the science? She says, is the science contained within an organization? The science limited to person? What does she say about following her? She says, follow me. Just as I, as I follow Christ. I follow Christ, exactly. The science is the is is God. It's Christ. 
not a person, it's not an organization. And we call her a leader because she, re she discovered it and revealed it, and it came to us through her. And if we don't, if we don't see that clearly, then we don't see the science clearly. It's that simple. This yeah. is nothing. This is not personal. She also in no and yet she says that dishonesty necessarily stultifies the spiritual sense which mind healers specially need. And and yes. And yes. Mm -hmm. And then she says, plagiarism from my writings is so common, it is becoming odious to honest people. And such compilations, instead of possessing the essentials of Christian science, are tempting and misleading. I think that's the danger, really. So. It is a danger. Just as, as uh, Linda read, you cut, your, you cut your fingers on it. She, it also quoted in this miscellaneous document, Students, there are enough in this room to convert the whole world to truth. If you will hold together, each one in their own place, not to try to do what has already been done, write a new science and health and Bible, <laughs> unless truth was revealed to us, not to try to write books, but to study what we had and to be content to grow that those who were explaining and simplifying her books might be better studying them and demonstrating what was there. And she said, will you do it? That is, we come into a higher sense, the spiritual sense of being. We would not feel the error. We would not feel or see it. That not one word of science and health was her own thought. She knew it came directly from God. But I thought that was interesting. Instead of investigating all these things, that you think are easier because there's no cross-bearing, no... Um, no handling animal magnetism. Yeah, no handling animal magnetism. These things that are you just sit and vis envision the good and all of that. It, it would do far better if you would study the textbook and, and learn from it and from the Bible. Demonstrate. And demonstrate. And here she is saying, hold your place. Don't get out of it. Um... And, and I know Florence and I, in the practice, we see promising students, poof, off they go. <laughs> you know, Goldsmith, I have that book or his letters or something. I don't know how I got it, probably. I'm not sure. I didn't buy it. But I have, I've been repelled by it. I have looked a little bit at it, and it, 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 I'm repelled. It repels me. And my feeling is, if you know even at least a little bit of this science and the truth of it and understand Mrs. Eddy's place as the woman in the apocalypse, these false teachings will repel you. Now, if they don't and you like to read them, I know Carrie and Bruce's mother love Joe Goldsmith. I've heard other people. They love various other people, new age people. Well, then, so be it. But... I feel your spiritual sense is it needs a little bit of tuning. And I will say that because who is telling of the foe and ambush? And if I get a lot of emails over this, so be it. Well, and that gets to another point. There's another book that has repelled both Mary and I, and that is the Peel Biography. Mm. And, and why does that repel us? Does it repel anybody else? I couldn't even read it. You couldn't read it? I could. Good for you. <laughs> it humanizes, Mrs. Eddy. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it, it attempts to take her away from her rightful place as well, discoverer please. and founder and leader of the Christian Science Movement, which is why we are so grateful for the carpenters. I'll go back to the carpenters forever and ever and ever because they wrote a biography of Mrs. Eddy that covered a very short span of her life but actually, but actually clearly showed 
her example and why she is the leader. It tells us why. It shows us. That is more useful than any other biography that probably has ever been written. I mean, there are good biographies, Mrs. Eddy. But what the Carpenters did was unique. Yeah, and had such great love and understanding of her. And of the science. And, and an example of how she demonstrated the, um, you know, the BOD, my understanding is many of them were, some of them afraid, you know, if it got out how Mrs. Eddy rebuked Arab, people would not understand or something. Well, that's a necessary factor to understand that she did rebuke error. You don't hide that. You bring it out and explain it as the carpenters did. So we know how to address it. So right. we know how to address mm -hmm. it. And he starts out... Which I is believe, why it's one of the three daily duties in the manual, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. An amenity of love in rebuking sin. And also in miscellaneous writings, Mrs. Eddy says, my students are expected to know the teaching of Christian science sufficiently to discriminate between error and truth, thus bearing their teacher a task and themselves the temptation to be misled. Now, sometimes it's astounding to me when people come to me telling me the class taught, you know, scientists all their life, third and fourth generation, and they've never even read the textbook, much less prose work. They certainly don't know what's in it. And that does the name of science, the cause of science, great damage, because they're going around saying they're Christian scientists, and they haven't even read. It's called a textbook for a reason. What is a textbook? <laughs> the new study? Learn from it. Yes. Guide. <laughs> so and they're stealing from the reputation. They are. They are. They're stealing from the reputation. Thank you. And they want the loaves and the fishes that come with the blessing that God has for us. So, but they don't want to earn it. That's right. So that's very much like the new age that we were talking about earlier. So a lot of times it's about what do I need to do to bring more peace and love in my life, okay? And nothing wrong with peace and love. <laughs> But just think about the things that the trials that Mary Baker Eddy went through, the trials that Jesus went through, the trials that the prophets went through. So if we find that in our life that uh, we're feeling sort of uncomfortable or we're unpleasant or because someone did something, whatever that is, well, um, so what? This is what we should, the way we should look at it, okay? We can't wilt, you know and say, oh, I look for that day when I have peace and love in my life, you know? We just march forward. Right, you use the science, absolutely. Ah, okay. So when, your peace depends on somebody. We had re Wednesday readings on that recently, didn't we? The price of peace. It doesn't come by just saying, God is love, God is love, while you're ignoring everything bothering you. There's a price to be paid for it. You earn, you earn it all. And in retrospection, an introspection on page 73, she writes a whole well, short article on plagiarism. And she also, in questions and answers, or somewhere in it's in miscellaneous writings, they ask about, you know, not giving her credit or reading things and not using the textbook. And again, she brings it back. How honest are you being? Are you giving her the proper credit for everything? It's partly why, you know, the, the idea of a full text lesson isn't... We all we get the full text, and I, I do love it because I write notes in it, and we also know that our proofers are proofing, 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 and making sure it's totally accurate to the books. But you have the books in your hand, you know nothing has been... Tampered with yeah. or mistake. Tampered with or mistaken. That's why it's so much fun to prove, because you have it right there. <laughs> yes. The books are indispensable, no question. So 
So I don't know what this means, but I do remember reading the full text a long, long time ago before it was permitted. And uh, these are people who were really trying, I thought, to do a good thing, but they were perpetually full of typos and things like that. Oh, boy. And they probably were typing it manually back that time, but so long ago. But uh, Which full text are you talking about? Yeah, decades ago. There were people who... No, 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 no. no. no, no. Oh, the Boston. No, 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 no. This is individual. There were individuals who produced the full text and would sell it to people. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, a long time ago, before the Boston Church ever said it was okay. Yeah. Oh, you see. The people had done it forever, and they probably just manually typed it up, and they had a mistake, and they don't have time to retype the page. Exactly. You know? Yeah. And this is why... Well, I mean, this is why you keep the books in your hand, and this is why the sloppiness that goes on um, and this is why in our church we proof and proof and check and check and double check. And Carol was astounded, right, in some of your proofing of the Peter B. Ross. Yes. The words had been, had been changed. Entire sentences were different. It was a lot that was changed. In the, but the one that we have, the lectures on Peter, from Peter B. Ross, this is accurate to the original. We were extremely careful with that. And we always are, and we thank our proofers for their exactness. And while I'm at it, when you're typing on the forum, it's appreciated if you are as accurate as you can be. It gives our proofers a lot of other extra work, I've heard, because there's just a lot of paraphrasing while people are putting it in quotes. Please check your work. We appreciate it. We must be accurate. If you're quoting, it is to be accurate. And remember, it, for your own for your own good, you're dealing with a science here. You can't be sloppy with the science, or or it won't work for you. Exactly. The other thing about the plain field uh, uh, full text is that the most important thing is that the intent behind it is the right intent, because I've looked at lessons all through the ages, and uh, it's amazing. The intent here is just marvelous. Well, thank you. Glad, good yeah. that you recognize it. And the, the, the intent has always been, God, what do you want for your children? And that's why the lessons are have to come out of inspiration. They're written by God through the the writers. But if it's not an inspired lesson, it doesn't pass muster. I don't, have it, in, I don't have it in front of me, but the uh, intent comes, actually. It's a bylaw that Mrs. Eddy has in the church manual. That's why all the lessons build on each other, too, <laughs> It's all part of his plan. It's so easy to see after a while. Wow, these just keep building. Well, anyone else? Linda, did you have anything to add to the New Age? Um, well, no. I just, if anyone has questions, we're ready for a response. <laughs> <laughs> I just highly recommend, just from my own past experience, to find out who you're reading. Because all you have to do is know a little history about them, and that probably would give you your answer. And uh, I, from my own experience, I know that reading this stuff creates a veil. There's a lot of innuendos that slowly take you away from the science and make you antagonistic towards Mrs. Eddy. It's like self-hypnosis, and uh, it, it gets involved with the occult. And it may send sound okay, and that tricks you have to know who you're listening to to do research. Because Tom's right, there are a lot of writers outside of the church that are just fine, so you have to know your reading and where they came from and what they're doing. So what results you get from it, too? Yeah. It's not bringing you any of the good, obviously. Or if it makes you hate someone, like hating Mrs. Eddie, that's obviously a bad sign. We're not trying to get anyone to hate any of these other Sometimes people. Sometimes it puts you into a church. <laughs> yeah. And I think those people, those who have written books that are good to read, they have they had no intention of, do, you know, uh, you know, belittling Mrs. Eddy or anything like that is the honesty in their intent to write, to bless. It's why I think their books bless. Right. You know? 
expect. Well, and if, if you know the real thing, if you know the science, you can't be deceived. But it's bad as people, you know, that don't know the science or they've heard bad things about the science, and so they just follow these false teachers. And as has been said, it, it's not to their benefit. Doesn't do them any good. I read something in class notes from Laura Sargent I thought was good for this. It's supply and demand. Realize that in the wonderful sense of oneness, there is nothing to be supplied. Man is the experience of all the fullness and inexhaustible completeness, which constitutes the divine nature. It's really like that. There's no, no reason to steal. We got it all. Thank <laughs> all you. Reason. That's a good note to end on. Very good. Well, one more note to end on. This in uh, miscellaneous writings, page 298 to two, I mean to three or three. Advice to students. I find I found it very helpful. Thank you. Yes, I, I did quote a little bit from there, but from that, mm -hmm. excellent. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Very good. It's all in there. If we just study and read it, it's all there. She. There's no question unanswered by Mrs. Eddy. So, thank you. Thank you all very well, thank much. Well, thank you all. Thank you. 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 Thank